I'm pleased this morning to be able to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Dara Richardson Heron. After more than two years of a global focus on health due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the voice of patients and decisions affecting their care has never been more important. That paralleled with the US reckoning on race puts additional emphasis on the systems that have historically underserved and or marginalized certain patient populations. In fact, the NHC has increased its commitment to health equity, prioritizing, in it, prioritizing it in its 2022 to 2024 strategic plan. In the fall of 2020, the NHC issued a consensus statement with the National Minority Health, National Minority Quality Forum and 58 chief executive officers of NHC member organizations committing to achieving health equity. And most recently, the NHC released a set of policy proposals developed through engagement with leaders in the health and other sectors, finding consensus on defining the problem in the areas of prioritization reflected in the recommendations. During her session, Dr. Richardson Heron will explore what do we need to understand about the history that delivered us to this time and place? What is the unique role of patient advocates now in the effort to make lasting and sustained change? Who needs to be at the table? How can we advance meaningful action? And what does getting it right look like? Dr. Dara Richardson Heron is a distinguished results-oriented former Fortune 100 corporate executive, board director, physician, and public speaker with more than 25 years of leadership excellence in the healthcare, corporate, government, and nonprofit sectors. A frequent speaker on health equity, strategic leadership, women's empowerment, clinical trial diversity, and vaccine confidence, Dr. Richardson Heron is a physician by trade and an advocate by choice, who is known for her authenticity, creativity, intellectual acumen, and unwavering determination to leverage her skills, experience, expertise, and passion to make the world a better and more equitable place. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Dara Richardson Heron. Wow, I'm going to take Diana with me everywhere I go. I was sitting there saying, I like that lady she's talking about. I really do. Thank you so much, Diana. And thank you to all of you for, for being here today. It's um, such an honor. Um, and, uh, you know, when you receive an invitation to come to Florida uh, and to meet with preeminent leaders and trailblazers and discuss a topic about which you are passionate Sometimes you just have to step up, be selfless and take one for the team. You know, it's just, you know, as I was sitting on my balcony looking at the pool, I'm like, you know, someone's gotta do this, might as well be you. Um, but you know, indeed that after the glorious decision I've made uh, to, to come here, I have no doubt that I made the right decision. So let me again say a huge thank you to the CEO, uh, uh, Randy, uh, board chair LaVarne, um, Susan Gaffney, your EVP, the entire NHC board staff, and all of you as the esteemed um, members in attendance for your leadership and for the gracious invitation uh, to join you today. I also want to express my heartfelt gratitude to Raquel Coding. Uh, she is one of the most amazing conference planners that I have run into, so thank you for your help with logistics. It's just been an honor um, and a pleasure to learn more about and, and witness the palpable passion for health equity that has been exhibited by the leaders of, of this team. Um, next slide, please. And yes, that hairstyle was in vogue in the 90s. I know, I know that's what you're thinking, but let's just get that out of the way. You know, Randy asked me to share a little bit about myself, my personal journey, both as a physician, as a health equity advocate, and provide a, a reminder about how we got to this place where health equity has still not been actualized. You know, he asked me to talk about what can we do and what role can we play to continue to advance meaningful action 
and sustain impact and work in partnership to build the future of health and health equity for all. So let me tell you a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Oklahoma City. My parents had uncompromising standards and they themselves led by example, encouraging me and my three sisters to be respectful human beings, to strive for excellence, but most importantly, to use our gifts, our talents and our blessings to make the world a better and more equitable place. And those of you who've heard me speak and you heard uh, Diana mention it, I describe myself as a physician by trade and an advocate by choice. You know, I chose to study medicine in New York City and it was no accident. I wanted to learn about healthcare and preventive medicine in, in one of the most diverse cities in the world at a place where I would have the opportunity to provide high quality care for an incredibly diverse array of people who presented with an equally diverse set of medical conditions and challenges. And I did my residency at Bellevue Hospital, which many of you know is the oldest public hospital in the United States. That was no accident either. And it was in many ways an inflection point because it was there where I actually saw patients, many who through no fault of their own presented with late stage disease that was often incurable. You know, for years I learned about health disparities in academic settings, but now here I was on the front lines seeing health disparities play out in a real way, often because people had inadequate or no access to health care. The social drivers of health prevented them from getting the care that they needed, or even worse. They faced unconscious and sometimes even conscious biases and racism and discrimination from health care providers in the healthcare system. Important to note also that I was at Bellevue at the height of the AIDS epidemic, when we had extremely limited treatment options and tens of thousands of people were dying, much like what we saw at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was a devastating time, I, I tell you, but it was also an aha moment for me, both personally and professionally. And among many other great lessons, my training at Bellevue and NYU opened my eyes to the reality very early on that health disparities are real. And during my life and career, I made a personal decision to do everything I could, not only to decrease the burden of disease, but to be an advocate with and for those individuals who were for many reasons underserved by our nation's healthcare system, some of whom who were not able to advocate for themselves. And so I followed my passion, which set me on a 30 plus year um, non-traditional career that has spanned corporate, academic, nonprofit, and government sectors to do my part to eliminate the many health disparities that have plagued individuals, communities, and our nation for far too long. Next slide, please. So whether it was designing a comprehensive work home wellness program at Con Edison in the 1990s that focused on enhancing the overall mental and physical health of employees and their families, or whether it was co-creating innovative medical school partnerships and curriculum to help build a pipeline of physicians who understand how to provide high quality, culturally sensitive and equitable health care for individuals with severe cognitive and physical disabilities, or whether it was sharing my knowledge as a physician and personal experiences as a now 25 year breast cancer survivor to help eliminate the significant disparities that we still see in breast cancer or whether it was revitalizing and restructuring the national YWCA USA organization or advancing policies and legislation to eliminate racism, empower women and dismantle the many health disparities that women face, or it was spearheading efforts at the National Institutes of Health All of Us Research Program to increase diversity in clinical trials and build the most diverse research cohort and genomic database in the nation's history to help researchers gain a better understanding of the many multifactorial causes of health disparities. Or in my most recent role as chief patient officer at Pfizer, where I have the unparalleled honor of partnering with what I called a dream team of incomparable leaders and patient advocates, a few of whom are actually in the audience today. Mike Zincone, Emma Andrews, and Patty Fine Jewel. This was at the height of the pandemic. We co-created and launched innovative global patient centricity and patient advocacy strategies, taking intentional steps to build an enterprise-wide culture where, where impactful patient advocacy 
is recognized as critical to the organization's success. And I also played a, a key role to help advocate for diversity of engagement and participation in our landmark COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials, boosting vaccine confidence and increasing vaccine uptake, particularly in underserved communities that were hit hardest by the pandemic. So I, I say all this to say that like many of you, I've devoted my life and career to advancing health equity. So I wanna assure you, I'm not speaking to you as a consultant, I'm speaking to you as a practitioner with decades of lived experience advancing impactful health equity programs and initiatives. And while I'm extremely proud of all that we have all done, I think we can all agree that we have a very long way to go. Next slide, please. Now, I just wanna take a few moments to provide a reminder about the history that, that's delivered us to this place and time. You know, and I've always found it valuable to make sure that we're talking um, from the same page uh, when we are speaking about the key areas of focus. So before we dive in, I just wanna go over a few definitions. And I like these from the CDC and, and many of you know them, right? But there are thousands of definitions out there, but I, I really like these. Um, the CDC defines health equity as a time when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. And they go on to identify health disparities as preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. And preventable here is the operative word. Next slide. Now, I wanna take a few minutes to highlight some of the key root causes of health disparities. And as you can see from this slide, it's messy, it's complicated. There are layers of, of common related and, and, and enormously challenging contrib contributing factors that combine forces to create the many devastating health inequities we see as a result. Next slide, please. And for many reasons, I wanna double click on the impacts of race and racism uh, and discrimination on health equity because only recently is this getting the focus that I believe it deserves. Your 2020 consensus statement that was just referenced um, says the following. Our current health system came of age when racial segregation and many other forms of discrimination based on such things as gender identity and sexual orientation, disability, and other factors were sanctioned by custom and law. Widely practiced discrimination bred structured health disparities for racial groups and other populations whom the society decided to disadvantage, end quote. Now, some of you may also be aware of a report entitled, It's Undeniable, Racism is a Public Health Crisis. That report was written by members of uh, the Health Care Anchor Network, which is a growing national collaboration of now more than 65 leading healthcare systems. And this report and many others written over the past few decades and very recently make it clear that you simply cannot create equitable health outcomes for Americans' communities without both naming and tackling the underlying and historic root causes that drive health disparities. You know, I'm actually old enough to remember the time when research in the area of health equity suggested that providers historically were more likely to perceive individual patient factors rather than social structural provider or health system influences as causes for health disparities. But what has become increasingly clear through a significant, consistent and long standing body of evidence and evidence-based research is the unfortunate reality that health inequities often arise as a result of the racist and discriminatory beliefs held by many people, including some healthcare professionals, that certain groups are superior to others. And this could play out in the form of, of racism, classism, sexism, religious intolerance, xenophobia, ageism, and I know my friend Sue Peshin is here. Uh, she's so passionate about that ableism, heterosexism, and other forms of discrimination. This ever-growing body of research further suggests that provider and institutional bias, discrimination and racism are major drivers of the disparities in health, contributing to differences in diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment decisions. 
As just one example, the American Heart Association members here will know this well, the findings from a, a review of, of 10 years of, of records from nearly 2,000 patients treated for heart failure at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and published in the American Heart Association's journal Circulation um, reveal that Black and Latino patients with heart failure are less likely to be admitted to specialized cardiology units. The researchers found that the discrepancy, like many other racial health inequities, wasn't fully accounted for by insurance status, established links to care, other medical conditions, or even an index reflecting the socioeconomic status of a patient's neighborhood. So the researchers um, suggested that discrimination and biases and not biology may explain the racial gaps they were seeing. Racial disparities in pain management are also well documented. Studies have shown that beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites, beliefs dating back to slavery, are associated with the perception that black people feel less pain than do white people. And this often results in inadequate or under treatment of pain for black patients, even when they are facing an in stage cancer diagnosis. A systematic review of published studies showed that many healthcare providers appear to have implicit bias in terms of positive attitudes toward white patients and negative attitudes toward people of color. Other studies have demonstrated that provider bias correlates with poor patient provider interactions and poor health outcomes. Implicit bias, as you know, includes thoughts and feelings that often exist outside of conscious awareness, and thus they're difficult to consciously acknowledge and control. However, whether it's conscious or unconscious. The impact and end results of racism, discrimination, and bias are extremely unfavorable for the individual on the receiving end. Indeed, many studies have shown that implicit biases and negative attitudes contribute significantly to disparities in health and healthcare. Next slide, please. Another very important root cause of health disparities, as you know, is at the system and policy level, the so-called structural drivers of health. This presents as discriminatory, racist, and unjust policies that lead to unequal power distribution, inequitable investment in communities, and exclusion of certain groups. And I want to make it clear why I'm using the term drivers instead of determinants. The word determinants implies that nothing can be done to change the situation. However, the word drivers helps to reframe the conversation and make it clear that the health inequities we are seeing in many individuals and communities are driven by factors that actually can be changed in a way that increases positive health outcomes. So words do matter. Next slide, please. And of course, we have population and community level root causes, also known as the social drivers of health. In his 2017 book, the Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, Arthur Richard Rothstein explains that Black citizens are not clustered into poorer housing because of personal preference or even due to a lack of financial resources, but rather as a consequence of flawed housing policies during the 20th century. And I think we all know that a growing body of evidence suggests that a person's zip code may be one of the biggest predictors of their overall health and life expectancy. Next slide, please. And of course, we have the healthcare system and organizational level factors, certainly inequitable access to quality healthcare and services leads to disparities, many like the ones I saw during my time at Bellevue. Next slide. And as we think about the root causes at the individual level, I'm the first to admit that we all for, fall short of making the right choices sometimes. And underlying genetics may play a role here, but what's really important to note is that people's choices are contingent upon what is available and affordable to them. Next slide. But at the end of the day, taking all of this together, all the root causes, they lead to the significant health inequities that we see today. What I have on the slide is just the tip of the iceberg. Think about it. The richest 1% of the US population lives approximately 14.6 years longer than the poorest 1%. Hispanics and Latinos have disproportionately high rates of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and end-stage renal disease. American Indians and Alaska Natives have the lowest 
life expectancy and the highest rates of diabetes and hypertension of any racial or ethnic group in the United States. More than 56% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual, and more than 70% of transgender individuals report experiencing discrimination in a healthcare setting. And individuals with disabilities regularly report perceived bias in their interactions. And get this, even before the pandemic, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimated that in 2019, some 70,000 Black Americans, nearly 200 per day, died prematurely, many from chronic conditions like heart disease and that they could have been better treated. Dr. David Williams, a, a health equity scholar at Harvard, who some of you may know, said the following, and I quote, the death toll is nothing less than the equivalent of a fully loaded jumbo jet falling out of the sky each day. Can you imagine? Why are we so laid back about this loss of life on such an unprecedented scale? End quote. I submit to you that his question is a very good one. Next slide, please. So, so what's clear is that despite our collective best efforts, these and many other root causes and drivers of, of, of health disparities continue to disproportionately impact the historically disadvantaged. And the net result is long standing and unacceptable inequities in health and health outcomes for people, many of whom are already marginalized in so many ways. Some researchers have posited that up to 80% of health outcomes are influenced by non-clinical factors. And while there's no current uh, consensus in the research on the magnitude of the relative contributions of each of these root causes, what we know for sure is that the impact of these inequities on the health of Americans, particularly in underserved communities is severe far-reaching and unacceptable, and it must be addressed this time. And, and let's be clear, naming and addressing disparities in health and healthcare is vitally important, not only from a morality, social justice, and equity standpoint, but it's also a vital component for improving the nation's overall health and economic prosperity. Health disparities are costly on so many levels. An analysis and research from the Kaiser Family Foundation estimates that health disparities amount for approximately $93 billion in excess medical care costs and $42 billion in lost productivity per year, as well as the additional economic losses due to premature deaths. Next slide. And as the population becomes more diverse, with people of color projecting to account for over half of the population by 2050, it's increasingly important for us to address and eliminate health disparities. Next slide, please. Now I know what you're saying. Did we really invite her to our conference to depress us? <laughs> this is the first time we've been together for a couple of years. We were all pumped after that family reunion last night and we woke up excited. And she's kind of a Dara Downer. <laughs> That's not my goal. I, you know, I, I'm just stating the facts. But I do have some good news. The good news is the fact that right now, after more than two grueling years of a global focus on health because of the pandemic, as one of the very few silver linings, a glaring spotlight is once again focused on health inequities all over the world. I recently had the honor and pleasure of joining a Hastings Center webinar on the topic of health equity where one of the presenters was Isabel Wilkerson, the first African-American woman to win a Pulitzer Prize in journalism. Wilkerson defined this moment in our nation's history as an iconic moment of truth, one where we must focus on and change the structure of society and the healthcare infrastructure we have inherited. Next slide. She, she likened our nation's healthcare system to an old house that is sinking as a result of a poorly constructed foundation. You know, after the building inspector comes in and highlights all the problems, even though none of us built that original foundation as the new owners, we cannot sit idly by and continue to watch it fall and crumble. Next slide. We must start to lay the foundational building blocks that are so desperately needed to elevate our healthcare system. Next slide, please. Indeed, as leaders and, and staunch healthcare advocates, we have an opportunity, and might I add, a responsibility 
to put on our hard hats and partner in our efforts to begin laying the rebar and the foundation for a much stronger and a much more equitable healthcare system than the one we inherited because the one we inherited is broken on so many levels. And certainly the voice of patients and patient advocates like those of us in this room is more important now than ever. And let's face it, we really have our work cut out for us. Recent world events, current world events, make it abundantly clear that there is a breakdown, not only in the foundation of our nation's healthcare system and infrastructure, but there seems to be a huge chasm in our collective humanity. I heard someone the other day say, I think our world has fallen off of its axis. I have to say, I agree. Next slide. But I'm determined not to be Dara Downer. So here's another piece of incredibly great news. And that's a fact that your organization and NHC leadership team and board in partnership with NMQF and, and all of you as members have already begun pouring that foundation for the building blocks needed to rebuild our nation's healthcare system from the ground up. Next slide. I, I hope each of you are as excited as I am about your new health equity framework and, and your policy recommend, uh, recommendations that were mentioned by Diana and, and LaVarn and, 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 and Randy. And, and not only do I, I love the content of your blueprint, but I really love the title, Access, Affordability, and Quality, a patient-focused blueprint for real health equity with emphasis on the real. This document lays out a pathway for achieving health equity that is brilliant in its clarity, its comprehensiveness, and most importantly, its actionability. So kudos to each of you um, for the invaluable work in this regard. And you know, even as I extend hearty congratulations, we must be mindful never to get too comfortable where we are. Indeed, as healthcare executives, leaders, and advocates, we must promise ourselves and the people who are counting on us that we will never, ever be comfortable when we know that there is the equivalent of a jumbo jet of more than 200 or more lives being lost prematurely and unnecessarily on a daily basis. So, Simultaneously, while each of you are partnering with the NHC and other natural partners to work fervently at the policy level to make lasting and sustainable change, I want to encourage you to even do a bit of introspection to make sure that you and your organizations are doing everything possible to advance meaningful action while building a strong foundation for the future of health equity. So since you've already selected four key policy recommendations to work on, I've selected four additional operational items that I am respectfully asking you to consider adding to your list as somewhat of a call to action. Next slide, please. So my first call to action is for you to make sure that you are leading by example, always striving to demonstrate equity as a core value in your own organization. If you haven't done so recently, I encourage you to take a comprehensive look at your entire staff on a local, even national level as appropriate. Ask yourself, is your organization as diverse as it could or should be? Do you have the right messengers within your organization or in partnership with your organization to be optimally impactful in driving and delivering the right health equity messages and the services to the right people at the right time? If not, Ask yourself, what can you do to improve where you are? I think we can all agree that in order to have the most impact, it's vitally important not only to have the right messages, but also the right messengers. And here's another thing. After you evaluate your team for diversity of messenger and message, I want you to drill down even further and ask yourself, are the health and social needs of my team being met? Is my organization pain our team members a living wage so that they can live comfortably and eat well and have adequate resources for their families? Is my organization providing them with benefits and resources that enable them to access high quality care and live their best lives? Is my organization addressing the drivers of health for my own employees? You know, Deloitte did a survey last year entitled the 2021 Drivers of Health. They surveyed 300 leaders from large health system and health plan organizations that found significant gaps in advancing the health and health equity of their own healthcare workforce. I don't know about you, but I found this 
revelation to be enlightening, alarming, and disheartening all at the same time. We always say that our team members are the organization's best and most valuable assets. One way to demonstrate that value is to authentically make sure that employees have access to the resources and support they need to advance their own health and well-being. And let's face it, employees will be much more passionate about addressing the needs of the people you're serving if their own needs are met. And my second call to action is for each of you to take a close look at the demographics of the people and communities you're currently serving. Ask yourself, does the population you currently serve reflect the demographics of the individuals with the greatest health disparities and needs? Does your organization have deep enough roots and a strong track record of impact in the underserved communities? Is your organization seen as a trusted go-to resource by individuals from diverse backgrounds? Are you equipped to reach the most underserved? While I understand that many of you provide exceptional services to a broad and diverse population of individuals, when resources are limited and health disparities continue to loom large for decades, it may be prudent to consider allocating precious human and financial capital in a way that addresses the most in need in order to have the most impact. My third call to action is to make sure that you as experts and leaders of our nation's most iconic health organizations, along with NHC and its collective mission to provide a united voice for the 160 million people living with chronic diseases and disabilities and their family caregivers are present at the tables and in the rooms and corridors where discuss discussions about advancing health equity are happening. And whether the discussion is related to policy, to strategy, to governance, infrastructure, funding, and anything in between, real health equity demands that we speak up and speak out. And most importantly, that we hold ourselves and our nation's leaders accountable for making the foundational changes in our system that are long overdue. And while always remaining professional, data-driven, and patient-focused, sometimes we have to be provocative and even be the loudest voices in the room because silence is not always golden, particularly when so many lives are at stake. And just to put a finer point on this, as many of you know, there are a tremendous number of conversations happening right now as we speak around payment models, access issues, diversifying the healthcare pipeline, diversity in clinical trials, and many other initiatives designed to decrease um, health disparities. Randy mentioned that Liz Fowler is gonna be joining you later. Uh, her team just proposed a requirement for providers to create a health equity plan uh, as part of participation in value-based payments. Just a few weeks ago, uh, in fact, in late April, CMS outlined their strategy to advance health equity um, as it relates to the building uh, pipeline for clinicians and researchers of color. You may have heard about the More in Common Alliance, a $100 million partnership between Morehouse School of Medicine and Common Spirit Health, a major health system designed to increase the uh, pipeline. They're looking for partners in this effort. And I encourage you to check out their website to see if there are any opportunities for you to join in. And the life science leaders in the audience, like my former Pfizer colleagues and the bio team and, and from pharma, uh, likely are aware of the FDA's recent guidance. Um, among other things, this new guidance is proposing the submission of a race and ethnicity diversity plan to support invest investigational new drug submissions. The draft guidelines were, were released in late April. And, and again, I think we're still in the comment period. So the point is, it's vitally important for patients, advocates like each of us to have a seat and a voice at these tables. Um, Gary Puckrin said to me, and I quote, while other stakeholders are at the table advocating for their respective priorities, patient advocacy at patient advocates can serve as a catalytic agent to help reframe the conversation in a way that ensures that the outcome will be much more focused on and most importantly, much more beneficial to patients wise words from a wise leader. And my final call to action is to implore you to meet people wherever they are, but please make sure that as you do this, that no one is left behind, particularly as the technology train bolts out of the station. I have to confess that over the years, I've been one of the biggest proponents of meeting people wherever they are, particularly as it relates to technology, 
I've been bloodied in battle more times than I care to remember as I advocated vociferously for telephone calls and paper surveys and other workarounds for individuals and communities who didn't have access to technology, a smartphone, a tablet, uh, or who simply just weren't interested in it, or people who lived in areas uh, where they didn't have broadband access. But this pandemic has forced us into a digital age that I don't even think the most futuristic technology experts could have dreamed of or imagined, not only in healthcare, but in practically everything we do, whether we like it or not, our world is now digital. And as our safety nets became increasingly digital during the pandemic, it grew harder and harder for us to ignore the devastating impact of the digital divide in our country. When the world as we knew it shut down to stop the spread of infection and we were all forced to consider new options of remote healthcare, when technology was a requirement even to locate testing and vaccination areas or enable our children and others to participate in distance learning and work from home, it became clear that technology broadband and, in, broadband and internet access, it's not a luxury. It's an absolute necessity. necessity. And yet many underserved communities were once again left behind. Whether we like it or not, our world is moving very swiftly to digital health. And let's be clear, there is no paper version of telehealth. So make sure that you go to Dr. Daniel Kraft's session on April 5th, uh, May 5th, I'm sorry. I think it's at 11 a.m. And it's entitled The Future of Health and Medicine, Embracing Technology and Take a Few Notes for Me. Um, because whether it's helping individuals to secure funding for devices and internet services for their home or connecting them to user-friendly and accessible training or advocating for federal initiatives to help build robust broadband networks, it's incumbent on us to help our constituents get more comfortable with technology because there are no backseas on this one. Technology is here to stay. Next slide. So let me just say that like each of you in this room, I'm keenly aware that health inequity is a highly complex multifactorial problem. And I, I can't even pretend to have all the answers, but what I do know for sure is that we have enough data and information to get started. We know the issues and of course we can continue to learn as we go, but we would all be well served to leverage the rich data and information we already have to start making progress right now. And at the risk of sounding like Dara Downer again, I have to say it's absolutely frustrating for me that we find ourselves in our nation in yet another health equity reawakening. In 1977, more than 40 years ago, Lewis Sullivan, the 17th US Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and founding Dean of Morehouse School of Medicine, and several other leaders commissioned a study entitled Blacks and the Health Professions in the 1980s, a national crisis and a time for action. Margaret, Margaret Heckler, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services at the time was said to be disturbed by the report which documented significant life expectancy disparities for African-Americans. And it's alleged that a heckler called the report, and I quote, an affront to our ideals and the genius of American medicine. That was 40 years ago. A month later, heckler commissioned a task force to investigate health inequities. This year marks the 37th anniversary of that landmark report, which many of you may know as a heckler report, the first comprehensive documentation of racial disparities in health by the US government, which led to the creation of the offices of minority health in 1986 in the CDC and the NIH and HRSA as a result. A full 37 years ago, this report substantiated significantly significant disparities and provided a, a comprehensive set of recommendations to reduce those disparities. This year marks the 20th anniversary of a report entitled Unequal Treatment, which was written by a blue ribbon panel of scholars of the National Academy's Institute of Medicine a full 20 years ago, this 764 page report meant no words about the inequality rife throughout medical care and provided in a long list of recommendations to fix them. And the global pandemic has shown yet another spotlight on the issues of, of health inequity and has led to another surge. I don't think it's a stretch to say that as it relates to health equity, we are data rich, and action core. And I often get the question, well, what does getting it right look like? Well, for me, the answer is very simple. Getting it right means actually following the blueprints that are out there. 
doing what the reports over the past four decades or more have suggested will work, actualizing the evidence-based actions and enacting the policy changes that have been recommended over and over and over to eliminate the root causes of health disparities and eliminate any disparity that exists solely on the basis of one's race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability status, or country of origin. It's my fervent hope that the pandemic is the last reawakening we will ever need. You know, when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke on uh, the March on Washington on August 28th, 1963, he said, and I quote, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is no such thing as being, there is such a thing as being too late. There is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. More than a half century later, Dr. King's words continue to be profound. And as it relates to the achieving health equity, we are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. The time for division, debate, discussion has long passed. Next slide. The time is now for action. And as so eloquently stated in your 2020 consensus statement, and I quote, it is time for a complete transformation of the healthcare system to promote unbiased structures and processes to advance equitable access to quality health care for all. And I couldn't agree more. So as I close, let me challenge each of you to operate on your edge as leaders, being intentional and purposeful to seek out new thoughts, new ideas, new partnerships, new ways of looking at things with people who are new as you travel the road to build the future of health. As you connect with your colleagues and learn from the outstanding lineup of speakers that Randy mentioned over the next couple of days, challenge yourselves and your colleagues to help you build an acumen and a whole new operating system as to how NHC leadership and your respective organizations can partner and be the leading, the loudest, the most impactful and the most sought after voice that drives positive change and real health equity now, I challenge each of you to go to your edge, even go beyond your edge and boundaries, because that's what it's going to take. And I have absolutely no doubt that trailblazing leaders like each of you in this room and the more than 140 incredible organizations and teams you represent will rise to the urgency of now. And please know that I will not only be cheering you on from the sides, but I will be continuing to do my part. Next slide. So I do hope that something I've said and something that I've shared with you this morning will empower, motivate, inspire, and even light a fire within you to rethink possible and not just discuss and imagine, but actually do what you can to build a bright and equitable future for health and health care, and not just for some of us, but for all of us. It's been my absolute pleasure and an honor to spend the morning with each of you. Thank you for your time and attention. And I look forward to working with you as we move forward.